well met, everyone. Welcome to Geek Thyself, a podcast by a nerd for other nerds that love geeking out over random facts and esoteric trivia. My name is Heather, and I'll be your host as we journey into the wondrous land of information. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of Geek Thyself. Well, I guess not welcome back because I'm starting it, but welcome to this week's episode. So uh, this week I'm going to talk about something that I am very familiar with because of my job, but also something that I don't think a lot of people know a lot about, but it's important to know a lot about because it can pose a big health risk, and that is rabies. Rabies is a viral disease, and it is something that is zoonotic. What that means is that it can pass from one species to another. In most cases, when you think of a rabid animal, people will think of, you know, the stereotypical images of like a dog hyper salivating. So just tons and tons of drool coming out of its mouth that's snarling at you. Or they might think of a wild animal that's doing the same thing and charging at you. That sort of thing. And while it's true that the virus can present that way for some creatures, it's not always the case. And it's important to know what signs to look for because rabies can be fatal. Now, what I mean by can be is that there have been people who have survived once the symptoms have already started to show. However, historically, if you are already showing the symptoms of the rabies vaccine, it's too late. If you know you've been exposed and you get the vaccines and the treatments very quickly or within time, then the majority of people are fine. They don't even end up having symptoms and the virus is able to be treated. But if you don't pay attention, don't realize you have it, or try to not get treatment, then you run the risk of dying. So it's something that I, working in the veterinary field, have to be very conscious of. Because even though most animals that are pets now are vaccinated for the rabies virus, there are still owners who choose not to for various reasons. And sometimes it's a health thing. Sometimes their particular patient has a very negative anaphylactic allergic reaction to the vaccine. And if that's the case, then, you know, they have to choose between vaccinating their pet and it possibly dying from a vaccine reaction. In situations like that, obviously, there's reasons why someone might choose not to vaccinate. Generally speaking, it is required by most counties here in California, and I believe throughout the U.S. in quite a few counties as well, to have your cat or dog rabies vaccinated. Dogs in particular are required to be rabies vaccinated throughout most of America. And then there are stipulations like the health risk that I mentioned, where sometimes they might, you might be able to get a sort of waiver from your veterinarian. But generally speaking, it's required to have your dog rabies vaccinated and licensed. I know both of mine are. For cats, It's a little hit or miss. Some counties do require that you have your cat rabies vaccinated and licensed with the county. Others don't. It varies county to county, state to state. So if you are unsure of what the rules are for where you live, I would recommend that you look into it, find out, make sure you know for your pets, not only for their safety, but also for yours. Another important thing is that just because your pet doesn't go outside or just because your pet doesn't go into areas where you would expect it to be exposed to the rabies vaccine doesn't mean it can't be. The rabies vaccine, because it is zoonotic and can be carried by a lot, or excuse me, the rabies virus, because it can be zoonotic and it can be carried by a lot of different animals, it is very easy for it to spread if people aren't paying attention. Now, obviously, there are a lot of programs in place all over to monitor the rabies exposures and keep an eye on animals that are known carriers. A really good example is bats. Bats are carriers of the rabies virus, but they don't actually develop the symptoms all the time. Um, It's a factor here in the Sacramento area where I live. There's, as an example, anyone who's from this area would know, there's a bridge called the Causeway. It's a very large bridge and it spans across a waterway between Sacramento and Davis, which is a nearby town. It's also where I went to college. Yay, yay, UC Davis. And um, that causeway bridge underneath it has a colony of bats. And 
bats are known rabies carriers. So it is something that's closely monitored in my area in particular, just in general, and should be monitored closely no matter where you live, unless you happen to be lucky enough to be in one of the areas that is rabies free. There are very few of them. One of them is actually the state of Hawaii. All of Hawaii, all the islands are rabies free. They're far enough away from the mainland that it didn't get there. And they were able, you know, to recognize that it was something they wanted to keep out before it ever got to the islands. So luckily for them, it's not something they have to worry about. But because of that, if you are ever going to Hawaii with your pet, there are months and months of procedures and documentation that you have to go through in order to make sure that your pet is allowed to legally enter Hawaii. Now, if you don't follow those rules and steps, you will be stuck in a position of trying to get to Hawaii with your pet and your pet will have to be quarantined at a facility in Hawaii until they're deemed safe for release and rabies free, which can take months. So it's definitely something where if this is anything you've ever considered or are thinking about doing, and honestly, just in general, if you're planning to move somewhere with your pet, please, please, please look into what the requirements are before you get too close to moving. I can't even tell you how many times we've had people call us and say things like, oh, well, I'm moving to XYZ country and I'm supposed to leave next week and I guess I need to get my cat checked before I travel come to find out we look into it and see what information they have to have in order to travel legally and there's this you know six page list of well they have to be rabies vaccinated they have to have had a microchip placed three months before you leave they have to have had a titer test to see if they have been exposed to rabies and that has to be done several months before you leave there's a whole list of things that have to be done if you're traveling somewhere with your pet especially international or to a place like hawaii where rabies is not existent and they want to keep it that way. So just in general, this has nothing, well, has a little bit to do with the rabies virus, but just generally speaking, if you're planning to move somewhere with your pet, please look into the rules and regulations way ahead of time. Otherwise you might be stuck in a position where you are supposed to move in five days, but everything that you have to do for your pet is going to take two months. And if you don't pay attention to that, you could be stuck in a very awkward situation and or have to leave your pet with someone until you can get everything sorted. We've had that happen too. We had to help them get everything figured out, but we did. But it takes a lot of time. Back to the rabies virus. So the rabies virus, because it is endemic, which means it's naturally existing in my area, is something that I have to deal with on a regular basis in terms of a health concern, both for myself, for my pets, and for everyone I come in contact with. Because hypothetically, if I contracted the rabies virus, I would then potentially be an exposure risk to everyone around me. Now, the way viruses work are, and this is a very simplified version, so anyone who actually knows more because they've studied a lot of biology, don't at me. This is me simplifying for people who don't have a lot of bio, biology or medical background. Basically, I think everyone pretty much knows our bodies are made up of different DNA strands and that's what makes us who we are. It makes our cells code different parts of our body to be different things. It's why my hair is brown. It's why my eyes are brown. It's why my voice sounds the way it does. My DNA tells my cells to create those things. Well, the DNA is basically the code which then creates the program and entity that is our body. Viruses are very, very tricky. What they do is they slip into your body, they slip into your system through whatever means they get in there. Depending on the virus, it's gonna change. But the virus gets into your system and it's encapsulated. So a virus, if you look at it under a microscope, and again, this is a very simplified version, is basically a bunch of DNA or RNA, which is part of the DNA replication process, inside a little capsule. So it's encapsulated and protected so that your body doesn't attack it when it gets into your system. What they do is attach themselves to cells and then the DNA or the RNA, whichever one it is, 
gets sort of injected into your cells and your body starts replicating that DNA because it can't tell the difference once it's already inside your cells. So again, this is a very simplified version and there's a lot of different types of viruses, but this is just one of the more common ones that I'm more familiar with, so I'm going into this one. But yeah, so essentially what happens, you've got your cell and the virus injects itself into your cell. What then happens is that all of the parts of your cell that recreate DNA over and over and over again in order to keep replicating cells and keep your body functioning now have DNA that isn't yours. It's DNA that belongs to this virus or RNA, which like I said, is another portion of the DNA replication cycle. There's either way, your body now has RNA and DNA that isn't yours, but it doesn't know that because it's inside of your cells. So it starts replicating that as well. And just like it does for your own DNA, you know, like why our skin cells regenerate, it keeps replicating it over and over and over and over again. And through that replication, the virus is able to spread throughout your body. Now, another unfortunate fact is that with a lot of viruses, because of the way they replicate, we can't always completely get rid of them. It's why for anyone who's ever gone to the doctor when they have a really bad viral infection of some kind, the doctor is often limited in terms of what they can do. Now, you might get a secondary bacterial infection and they can give you antibiotics to get rid of that, but once a virus is in your body, it's in your body. You can't get rid of it with antibiotics because the virus is inside your own cells. So it's really hard to get rid of. Now, and of course, your body's also constantly replicating it because it's tricked your system into doing that. The problem then becomes, what do you do? Well, in the case of the rabies virus, unfortunately, it has a built-in self-limiter to a certain degree. This self-limiter is not ideal, though, because the way it limits itself is by causing death. So it does eventually stop replicating and it does eventually stop with the host creature. However, in order for it to stop spreading from the host creature, that creature has to die. So for obvious reasons, this is not ideal in a lot of situations. In the case of the rabies vaccine, it specifically happens in mammals. So if you happen to be a reptile owner or a fish owner or something like that, you don't have to worry about your lizard getting rabies. But if you have a cat or a dog, or if you happen to live in an area that has a lot of wildlife outside, a lot of mammalian wildlife, so things like squirrels, raccoons, possums, anything like that, then it is a concern. And obviously there's also bigger mammalian and wildlife outside, things like mountain lions or bears or whatever, depending on the area you live in. What the virus does is causes inflammation in the brain. And the symptoms, some of the earlier symptoms include things like fever. They can also include tingling at the site of exposure. And this is something we know because humans, of course, over all the years that it's been around, have been exposed. And so we do know that that's one of the symptoms some of these people have felt. Unfortunately, those symptoms are also followed by um, much more violent and aggressive symptoms. Things like violent movements uncontrolled excitement, hydrophobia, or fear of water. Um, they often can't move parts of their body correctly and or will have some paralysis. They'll be confused because, of course, the inflammation in the brain is causing them to not think clearly, and they'll also often have a loss of consciousness. The other thing that's really unfortunate, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's a very deadly virus, and unfortunately, once the symptoms appear, death is often the result. It's not always the result. There have been exceptions. If you look in recent years, there have been cases where someone was exposed and they started to show symptoms and they were actually able to basically be put into a medically induced coma. And in the medically induced coma, the doctors were able to administer medications and treatments in a way that allowed them to actually have the person survive through the virus but it is extremely uncommon for that to happen. And it's one of the reasons why, for anyone who's ever wondered, why does my county care if my dog is rabies vaccinated? 
That's why, because if your dog isn't rabies vaccinated, gets the virus and bites somebody, it doesn't matter who it is. They could bite the mailman. They could bite the neighbor's kid. It doesn't matter. Anything like that, if your dog happened to get it because you didn't vaccinate them, you've now created a huge life-threatening problem for the person that your dog or cat or whoever bit and passed the virus on to. That's why the county cares. It's why the CDC cares. It's why it's such a big deal. This virus is almost always fatal. It almost always kills what has contracted it. And that is why people get so concerned about it and freak out so much because if the animal that is carrying it bites you and spreads it to you, you have to seek immediate medical treatment. You should seek immediate medical treatment. Can't stress that enough. And so it's a big deal. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to touch on it today again because I think it's something that a lot of people have heard of. They know it's a bad thing, but they don't actually know how bad it is. It's not just something that's, you know, oh, it makes that animal aggressive and it's unfortunate and I don't want to get attacked by an animal that's angry. No, 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 no. If you get attacked by the animal that's angry or that's gone rabid for one reason or another, you don't only have to worry about the injury it's giving you. You have to worry about your own death happening months later when the virus starts showing up and giving you symptoms. That's why it's important to know about. I'm going to do a real, I say this every time, I'm going to try to do a real quick little mid-roll thing. I'm not always quick at it, so I appreciate or apologize for that. And then when I come back, I'll tell you more about some of the symptoms, some of the things to look out for, and some of the things you can do to protect yourself and your pets. Okay, so real, real quick. World Anvil. If you like world building, I cannot stress enough that World Anvil is an amazing website. They're so robust. There's so much world building tools. So much world. Wow, my English is great today. So many world building tools there that you can use. I cannot stress enough that you should go check it out. It's worldanvil.com and you can go check out the different worlds that those of us here at Nerdsmith have, have created. I know Chaotic Goodness has started creating their worlds. We've got the one for Countless Heroes. Definitely go check it out, worldanvil.com. Our other wonderful sponsor who's amazing is Die Hard Dice. I've talked about them a lot, can't talk about them enough. The dice are gorgeous, just absolutely gorgeous. So of course, that's a big factor. But then on top of that, they're just really nice people. They're a great group of people. They send handwritten notes with a lot of their dice. You know, sometimes they'll send birthday wishes along with it if you mention that you're getting it for someone's birthday. It's all these kinds of things that are just so sweet and above and beyond and not something they have to do because their dice are already gorgeous and people would buy them anyway, but they want to do it. And that just makes them even more amazing. So dieharddice.com, please go check it out. And with that, we're going to get back into this week's topic. I think I kind of accomplished a short mid-roll, sort of. Okay, so welcome back. I kind of made a short one. Ugh. I'm not I'm not good at short mid-rolls, sorry. But with that, let's move into more information on the rabies virus. So I've already told you some of the primary symptoms. The, the short version is that... Because the rabies virus is putting so much pressure and inflammation into the brain, the patient that is presenting with symptoms is going to have neurological issues. Now, that doesn't automatically mean that every patient that comes in with neurological issues automatically has rabies. Obviously, that is not the case. But it is something that in my line of work, we have to be aware of and keep an eye on when we're treating patients who are presenting in certain ways. If they're non-responsive, if we know that they're not recently vaccinated, if we know that they haven't been seen at a vet for a long time, or if we know that they go outside and therefore have a higher risk of exposure to other animals that might have rabies, those are all things that have to be taken into account. And so it is something that those of us in the veterinary field are particularly aware of because unfortunately there are a lot of people out there who don't realize how important the rabies vaccine can be. And it's a perfect example of, you know, unfortunately there are some owners who feel that their veterinarian might be talking about doing vaccines every year just because they want the money from the vaccines every year. That's not the case. We're recommending vaccines and things like the rabies vaccine in particular because it's a 
disease that could potentially threaten the life of your pet, and in the case of rabies, also other species, including yourself and your kids and your parents and your family. Anyone who's come in contact with the cat or dog could potentially become exposed and end up with the rabies virus. Now, one thing that does help is that it is primarily sent through bites. It's not something that transfers as easily through blood or through scratches or anything like that. It's usually through saliva. So if you don't get bitten, if you just get scratched by an animal, the chances of exposure are definitely less, but you still have to worry about being exposed because a lot of wild animals and a lot of domestic animals groom their feet. So there is still some chance that wet saliva was on their feet when they scratched you. So that is something to keep in mind. Even if you just get scratched, it can still technically be considered a rabies risk, depending on if the patient comes back positive. So another unfortunate thing about the rabies vaccine is that there is what's referred to as an incubation period. Now, people are more familiar with this in terms of the common cold, where you're exposed to your friend, and then seven days later, your body starts showing the same symptoms they were, because there was an incubation period where your body was trying to fight it off and didn't manage to. In rabies, for humans in particular, the incubation period can be around one to three months, but it can also go up to six months. And there have even been a few cases, though it's not common, where it could be a couple of years before the virus actually started producing symptoms. Unfortunately, this means that just because you got bitten by an animal that has it doesn't mean you were exposed you um, knew you were exposed immediately. And so that's why if you ever get bitten or scratched by a strange animal that you've never met before, you should always call your doctor and talk to them and find out about whether you should get the rabies vaccine, whether they should treat it. Always, always talk to your doctor if that happens, especially if it's an animal you've never met. Even if it's your friend's dog or cat, you know, there's some concern about it, but at least that way, if something happened to that dog or cat, you would know and therefore you would know to go get yourself checked out. If it's just some random animal you've never met, you should always talk to your doctor, always, 100%. Another unfortunate thing is that usually the symptoms don't show up, so the obvious signs that rabies is present in the patient don't show up until seven to 10 days before the patient dies. Because of this, there's a lot of different counties and states that will have what's referred to as a rabies quarantine period. So hypothetically, if one of my cats who are indoor only and vaccinated, all, you know, all of that, but if one of my cats scratched someone, even though they're up to date on vaccines or indoor only doesn't matter, in my county, in my area, they're considered under a rabies quarantine. Now, if they're vaccinated and things like that, most of the time you're not required to do anything crazy except keep them inside for 10 days, which, you know, mine don't go outside anyway, so it's easy. But the reason there's a 10-day period on it is because if the patient that bit or scratched someone is positive for rabies, within that 7-10 to 10 day period, they would be expected to pass away because that is usually the time frame that the disease takes. Once the symptoms show and the pa patient is actively drooling or actively acting neurologic, at that point, there's usually maximum of 10 days before they pass away. So if the patient that bit you or scratched you passes away within that 10 day mark, there's procedures that have to be taken and testing that has to be done to make sure you're safe. But because of that, those rabies quarantines are very important. So if your vet ever asks you about those or is asking if your patient is vaccinated, some of those are the reasons why, because we're trying to figure out, is it safe for us to handle your patient, especially if they're grumpy at the vet, or is it safe in terms of the patient's health? Like what's their exposure risk? There's a lot of reasons why we ask a lot of questions about rabies in particular. So short recap, Rabies is a virus that is infectious to mammals, meaning you, me, cats, dogs, rats, bats, anything that's warm-blooded. There's some evidence that it can be carried around in other species, but it's not common, and it doesn't usually infect them the way it does us and cause death. So it is extremely unlikely, but not 100% impossible. 
Another thing is that it is almost always deadly, and especially once the symptoms actually start to show up, survival is almost unheard of. There's been very, very few cases, except in recent years, like I mentioned earlier, they've been able to put a couple of people in comas and have them survive, but it's extremely rare. It's extremely unlikely. This virus is one that is actually RNA-based. I mentioned that at the beginning, but it basically tricks your body into replicating its own RNA, making more and more and more of itself. And as it does so, it spreads throughout the body. This one particularly targets the brain and causes a lot of inflammation in the brain, which is why you have neurological symptoms. Because it is zoonotic and can be passed from one species to another, namely it could be passed from your dog or cat to you or your children or your family in general, it is very, very important to get your patients, get your cats, your dogs, any pets, rabies vaccinated as per your veterinarian's recommendation. Every veterinarian is going to have different regulations for their areas. They're going to have different recommendations based off of your personal patient's health. So check with them before, you know, trying to demand it because there might be a medical reason why they don't think your pet should have it. But it is something where if you've never had it done for your pet or if you've never really considered it important, you might want to look into how serious of a rabies exposure situation there is in your area. I know for a fact that in 2017 there was a rabies positive cat in the greater Sacramento area, not too far from where I work. And because of that, we really started stressing more to everyone and letting them know, hey, this is something you need to be aware of. This cat got it. Another thing is that when the testing is done on the animal after the fact, they can sometimes tell what strain of rabies it is. So like, did this strain come from a skunk? Did this strain come from a bat? That sort of thing. So if you happen to have bats or anything like that in your area where you'd be more worried about exposure being a risk, it's definitely something to keep in mind when you're looking at sort of what you're going to do long term with your pets and also how much of a risk am I at? How much of a risk do I have? Because if you know for a fact your pets are not vaccinated, you might want to call your vet and talk to them about getting that fixed. Especially if you live anywhere with a lot of wildlife or if you take your pets outside with you or go hiking with your dog or anything like that. If, if your pets risk being exposed to a lot of wild animals, it's an even higher concern because obviously animals out in the wild are not necessarily getting vaccinated. Although there have been some programs implemented to basically drop specially treated um, food and treats and things like that into forests so that animals will eat them and get a little bit of a rabies vaccine that way. However, it's hit or miss. They can't guarantee the animals are eating it. They can't guarantee they're getting the vaccine amount they need. So it's still a little hard, but there are some programs they've done for things like that in areas where it's really bad. And depending on where you live, this particular episode may just be a random informational thing for you because rabies doesn't exist in your area. If you happen to live in one of those spots, then, you know, kudos to you because that makes life a little easier. But if you don't live in one of the areas where rabies is non-existent, then I definitely recommend you look into it and find out what your area recommends based off of risk of exposure, how many episodes of it they've had in recent years, that kind of thing. It's important to look into. And I think, like I mentioned, a lot of people kind of not necessarily brush it under the rug because I think a lot of people realize that rabies is at least somewhat dangerous. But in movies and things like that, it often gets portrayed as just, oh, look, that dog is rabid. It's going to bite everybody. It's not the dog attacking you that's the bigger concern. It's the rabies virus that it exposes you to. That's the bigger thing. And that's also why you should never, 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 cannot stress enough, never approach an animal that you don't know or sometimes even one you do know that is acting extremely strangely. If it is acting neurologic, if it's acting weird, if it's not walking steadily on its feet, anything like that, if you should not touch those animals, you should call your animal control officers, you should talk to them, you can call your vet if you don't know, want to call animal control for some reason and ask them what they would recommend with that particular patient. But there's a lot of things that 
you run the risk of exposing yourself and everyone in your life too if you go to touch those animals. So raccoons, possums, bats, anything like that. If you see it acting weird, please, please don't go pick it up and touch it. Just just don't risk it because you don't know. And this is why they always are saying, call animal control, call wildlife people, don't touch it. It's why so many wildlife people wear a lot of protective gear and gloves and special things like that. Because we know working in an animal related veterinary field that we run the risk of exposing ourselves to those diseases. And it's why we take so many precautions. For example, the cat hospital that I work at, we have big leather gloves. They almost, they look like falconry gloves. And we wear those whenever we're dealing with a patient that's more aggressive. Now, honestly, in terms of our patients, most of them are just upset because we can't explain to them why they're going to the vet. And cats don't like change very much. So they get put in a box, they get carted somewhere they don't go very often and then they get poked by a bunch of people they don't know i would be pissed off too i understand why they're angry with us but because of that we take extra precautions because we don't want to get bitten we don't want to get scratched and not only because we're worried about things being exposed to us but also because obviously it hurts we don't want to get bitten and scratched so there's a lot of things that we in the veterinary field will do to protect ourselves and protect the community that involves treating for the rabies vaccine or vaccinating for the rabies vaccine, things like that. So if it's something that you have not looked into before and you know it's in your area, I would definitely recommend taking a look. If it's something that you want to find out more about, there is tons of information that you can look up online because it is something that is prevalent in a lot of areas. It's on every continent except Antarctica. Not every country is, has it, but it is all over the place. And a lot of islands in particular don't have it because they're separated enough from the mainlands that it just never transferred over. Lucky for them. So look into it for your area. Make sure you know the risks. Make sure you know some of the symptoms and signs to look out for. And with that, I'm going to close out this episode. I'm sorry this topic's a little bit more of a downer episode, I guess. I mean, it's very informative, I think, because this is a very important topic, but it's not exactly a super happy one. So sorry about that for anyone who cares. But with that, I'll be back next week and I will talk to you then. Please remember to check out all the other wonderful shows and productions that we have at nerdsmith.org. You can submit questions or topic suggestions to me on Twitter at amethyst underscore magic with a CK. Or you can email me at geekthyself at nerdsmith.org. I'll be back next week with a new and interesting topic. Until then, don't forget to geek thyself. In a world that's forgotten the meaning of hero. We're not actually helping that much. It's like a cardboard box. It's all old and kind of ratty. Um, I believe there might be some mistake. I said proctor equipment. Yeah, no, this this is it. Bronze badge, lost and found. Here you go. Mm. <laughs> and the arrow didn't hit bone, so you can reuse it. Reuse the bone? We're looking for a dragon named the Scottish Play. There's only so much that editing can do. <laughs> Is there someone else we can talk to? Nobody quite as cheerful as Robin. You mean they get worse? And more privileged, yes. Stone Coast Railway, Cal! <laughs> Come to Stone Coast Railway! Come on, Cal! He seemed excited by the prospect. He was, and then he found out that it devalues the painting, and that kind of broke his heart a little bit. His little heart a little bit. <laughs> yeah, how's that feel? Take that. Bad. <laughs> you talk was that? Oh no. Was there was there a joke was, in there, yeah. Kyle? Did no. you wanna you no, wanna, fine. Do you wanna take another swing at that one? Shenanigans. An actual play D D podcast. Available on nerdsmith.org or wherever you get your podcasts.